Welcome to Cartoonist Kayfabe. My name is Jim Rugg. I'm Ed Piskor. And today we're going to look at In the Studio, Visits with Contemporary Cartoonists by Todd Hignite. This is from 2006, I believe it was published. And it, and it spun out of Comic Art Magazine, which Todd Hignite was, I think, publisher and editor of. There were eight or nine issues of this in the early 2000s, maybe 2002. Um, this is number one, fall 2002. And he, these studio visits were, I think, in five of these. All the studio visits that are in the book are not in this magazine, but this is a terrific magazine. We should look at it further sometime, Ed. Easy to do. But I thought it would be fun to just kind of flip through because 2002, I'm making comics. Very beginning, around this time is the birth of Street Angel for me. And this is the stuff I'm looking at. You know, like I probably bought this on New Comic Day at Phantom of the Attic. And it was pretty great because it's me looking at as much stuff as I can find. It's still the early days when reprints are starting and imports are sort of, you know, just starting. So everything wasn't available yet the way it is now. And magazines like this were huge to yeah. be like, you know, put Frank King next to, this is an insert, a Jaime Hernandez comic insert. And then, you know... It's artwork that is being considered. It's interesting advertising, like the Bernie Kriegstein book. That's EC Publications that Fanographic was putting out. No Sickles and Milk Kniff, two very influential early strip artists. Chock full of Intel, these these mags, man. Yeah, they were they were really exceptional. And it fell out of the sky, like just all of a sudden you go to the comic shop one one week, man, and this was there. I don't know. Uh, I don't have any friends who didn't pick that thing up. And so this is the in the studio section. And the first issue here is Dan Klaus. And it would showcase things that were in their studio that weren't by them as well as art by them. And the best part is it was accompanied by not exactly an interview, but, but words from the artist regarding the artifacts that we're seeing. Yeah, and if you go back a couple pages, man, that's one more. That's uh, everybody's introduction yes. to Ken Landgraft on your uh, left left-hand page. 100% this is where everybody that knows Ken Langreff, this is where it starts. Yeah. Even if you heard about it from someone else, they heard about it here. This was definitely like the Ken Langreff, you know, ground zero for his introduction into where we're at. And uh, again, just kind of to, to conclude this flip through of an, of an issue, Gary Panter. Is this the Panter stuff that that's in uh, the In the Studio book? No, no, no. That it's. Uh, I don't know if his In the Studio was in an issue or not. This is just looking at work that Panter's doing at the time. Look at those pages, man. He said he could the, do uh, uh, like like one uh, one square inch would take like five or six hours. He yeah, he would do like a panel a night, I think. Um, so this is the Jimbo and Purgatory stuff. Pretty interesting, combining all kinds of hit comics and art history and pop culture history in one place. And then this is an interview with Chris Oliveris, the publisher at the time of Drawn and Quarterly, which is pretty insightful. And again, like the stuff that you would see in the magazine like this, it just expanded my mind to what was out there in comics and really put me on the search for all of this different different kind of comics, much more than I realized existed. Um, article by Trina Robbins on Tarp Mills and Miss Fury. Uh, Tarp Mills being a female cartoonist who was doing a strip about a female protagonist in Miss Fury. So pretty unusual piece of comics history there. And Trina Robbins, fascinating in her own right, did underground comics, did mainstream comics, wrote extensively about comics, so kind of a renaissance woman in terms of comics history. And even the ads in this old magazine would be very interesting. He got the right stuff. Go, go back one. Is that... Uh, okay, no, I thought that was going to be Heritage, but I think... I think there is a Heritage ad in here. We may have passed it already. I think there's one for, like, Beguiling's uh, original art sales. So it, it really is a nice magazine, especially if you're into the comic art side of things. Which is where Hignite comes from. Yes. And uh, Superheroes in the 60s, Comics and Counterculture. Just a really kind of interesting cross-section of comics, 2002. And it ran, again, I think eight or nine issues, probably until... 2004 2005 somewhere in that vicinity i'm laughing because uh this to me would be like you know the 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 cartoonists wizard magazine and i'm thinking about i'm thinking about our audience and i, <laughs> I imagine that there's actually a big turnover like like the people who came on for the wizards they're no longer with us man. i would like to look at more of these you know we've looked sure. at a couple comics journals um i like all of these kind of magazines all the way into like the fanzine stuff you know of, of it's all comics. It's all looking at comics from different angles. So, you know, at some point I would definitely be up for uh, putting comic art 
under under the microscope and looking at an issue or looking at the series, whatever you want to do in the future. Easy to do. But we are here for In the Studio. This is an incredible book. Reviewing this book, I, I bought this whenever it came out. Mm-hmm. Um, I may have gotten it Remainder Dead. I think you mentioned that. All of these great art comic books, the early ones, it seems like a lot of them in, went into the Remainder because they're expensive to produce, so I guess they print a lot of them. And so eventually they end up somewhere. Um, you know, you can find these because they are nice print runs. Since, since we started the channel, uh, there was sort of a bolstering of the old idea that... Um it's not the creator, it's the characters. And what I mean by that is our fucking wa- making well, the Watchmen book, whatever the fuck that thing is called, gets more numbers than a Dave Gibbons shoot interview. And same thing goes for like the Eric Larson shoot interview where we talk about the comic and it gets more love. So this stuff that's in the weeds is for you and I. It's not for the consumer. Yeah, I, I, for sure. There's definitely um, like a book collector group out there you know and and these are the books that you want yeah for sure um you know if you're into these these kind of like really beautiful fine reproductions um there's a group that collects that stuff uh, is this uh, abrams this is yale okay which is kind of unusual um it does feel like an abrams book or uh maybe a pantheon book something of that sort a high-end nicely produced book definitely has the uh the pantheon rogues gallery of cartoonists in the mix yeah it sure does so i don't know what all yale university press has published in terms of comics but there are a handful of these university presses i think mississippi i want to say yeah has, they, has they published the, some stuff mississippi does the conversations book uh yale had did um i think the, they did a chris, chris Ware. yeah the chris Ware essays where jeet here goes into great <laughs> detail about what what Chris Ware ate for breakfast on <laughs> April 13th, 1987. Very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. One thing going into this, Ed. So here's the table of contents. And you see there are nine artists. Robert Crumb, Art Spiegelman, Gary Panter, Charles Burns, Jaime Hernandez, Daniel Klaus, Seth, Chris Ware, and Ivan Brunetti are the studios that we're going to visit in this book. And I made a couple of notes on... Um, recurring themes things that Ah. we'll see through a couple of artists so i'm going to run over those and uh those watching at home can kind of keep track and notice whenever this stuff pops up one is uh japan both comics and sort of art in you know japanese art history uh both of those topics come up and i think that makes total sense printmaking is referenced by a couple of these artists in the work they produce and also the work that influences them Dick Tracy, uh, specifically Chester Gold, Dick Tracy. We'll see a couple of those originals uh, in these collections. Roy Crane, Jesse Marsh, the Tarzan artist. And um, Outsider Art is mentioned by a few people, especially whenever they're showing some of the pieces from their collections and some of the lesser-known cartoonists that these cartoonists respond to. So... uh, Acknowledgements, including artists and collectors who lend them stuff like Glenn Bray is mentioned as, as contributing some of the artwork that is photographed in this collection. In that case, it's usually art from the artists like a Dan Klaus piece or Robert Crumb piece or Hernandez uh, because Glenn Bray is a pretty famous comics collector. Fanographics put out a beautiful collection uh, or a beautiful book of some of his comics related collection. Um, yeah, we'll be getting into that. But Jimmy, if I wanted to read, I'd go to school. <laughs> Last note on it is there is the text in the book is great. You know, from the introductions to all of like each artist gets a profile in the beginning to kind of contextualize their work. And then, as we mentioned, each of these pieces is accompanied by the artist's words about the piece, which is incredible. Yes. It's such a great insight. This is Robert Crumb working on Genesis. Yep. So uh, trying to figure out what God's going to look like. <laughs> yes. And, and talking about Genesis and how literal he is going with the adaptation and how shocking that's going to be to, to people whenever they see that literal interpretation in pictures. Yeah, I think we all skipped the part about the literal interpretation, and everybody was stoked on it. And then when they got it, they were like, hey, this is the book of Genesis. What the fuck, man? <laughs> I gave that to my aunt, who's very religious, to read. And we did not discuss it when she handed it back. The one thing, because he can't help himself, he did draw uh, the Three Stooges as a few apostles <laughs> in, in, in a couple of pages. So he did have a little bit of fun, at least. And then referencing an old, there have been a lot of Bible comics over the years from stuff clearly aimed at kids to more interesting things like the Chester Brown adaptations. Yeah, and this is the Max Gaines uh, EC, ed- educate, where E stood for educational comics. Yeah, and, and he says the drawing's not very good, sloppily done. <laughs> 
it'd be amazing to think of the EC comics, like the, the new direction artist doing Bible adaptations. <laughs> it would be you, incredible. You could see the, like there's, there's the, what they call the pre-trend where uh, it's still, it's still uh crime and shit, but um, it's a different set of artists. And then it's the earliest versions of like a Wally Wood. Um, and you know, it's still pretty good, but very, very rough. The early comic strip, this is Crumb talking about history of comics and how hard it was to find that information. Think about that, man. Like, where the heck would you find that stuff? And it makes me, like, every book that, that pops up in here, I want to hold and look at. For you sure. know, like, what kind of, like, early comic strip information is he getting out of this thing? You know, it's it's from 1973, this book, and it's comics from, like, 19, 1450 to 1825, like, early you know, this is Scott McCloud saying, like, this stuff is what comics, you know, turn into, or the roots of comics, I guess, would have been covered in this book. Um, Carl Barks, of course, a pretty famous uh, influence on everybody, no highly regarded as one of the great early cartoonists. Yeah, no secret. So what we're looking at up there is, uh, far left is Carl Barks' piece. And we see why he's called the good duck artist, because <laughs> you just look at that very next comic, and, it, and it's totally like... A Xerox of a Xerox kind of thing. And it's then, so clumsy, the composition. Yeah. And then, you know, the final piece up there is a distillation of Crumb's psyche from years and years of reading the, the comics from the good duck artist. But, of course, he has to take it to those perverted places. And then, of course, Harvey Kurtzman in Mad Magazine. Uh, again, EC Comics. One of the universal influences on comics history and you for look, everyone. And that Basil Wolverton, uh, that, that is, you know, that is a part of... R. Crumb's ticks. Yeah, Basil Wolverton always looks so great and seems to like not age. Like his his work looks as good now as it did oh, for the sure. day it was published. Maybe better now. Who there's, knows? There's nobody like him, man. And and uh, timeless in, in the days of graffiti and 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 Adult Swim cartoons and shit. This could, this can comfortably fit in there, uh, totally. no problem. And nobody would confuse it for being you know something old. But uh, a lot of the stuff that we will be seeing associated with all the cartoonists. Like it becomes so clear, it, mm -hmm. it it casts such illumination on on their work, and and every piece is chosen perfectly to illustrate you know the, the person whose studio it is. It does feel like you're going in their head. Mm -hmm. It's really great, and also a lot of the stuff that's in here has since been reproduced in really nice editions. You know, like Basil Wolverton, Fanographics has put out a couple of amazing books of his, you know, biographical and showing all of his art in great reproduction qual quality. So. A lot of this stuff that would be mentioned as some obscure artist now exists in affordable, nice reproduction. That's so important to Crumb. Like that exact cover, he talks about that so much, has written essays about that. Weirdo is uh, some of my favorite Crumb, those weirdo covers. It yeah. feels like that's the top of his drawing powers. Like he is just illustrating and, you know, through his, his personal style. It is great to see the influence and then the piece that comes out, the pieces that come out of it. So, so this this book and this series of essays, or whatever you would want to call them, they really have last like left a lasting impression on comics. So, like we all get introduced to a guy like LB Cool from this piece. Fanographics will later, you know, find all the LB Cool work that they possibly can and make like beautiful books. So there's been about four or five different things. Don't know Ken Landgraf's stuff. <laughs> Not yet. That's the, <laughs> the great white well that some publisher should be courting. Um, I also see like you look at this and think like Spain Rodriguez had to be had to be looking at this stuff or yeah. or looking at his buddies, you know, looking at Robert Crumb's collection. It feels like Charles Burns would have been pulling from an LB Crumb and the Fanographics edition of this is beautiful and it highlights like the super bright colors it's called black light i yeah. think and it's mostly cover work by him but very uh, spectacular stuff these are panels from another 1950s artist jay dispro yes and dispro i find fascinating i have found him in quarter bins and stuff he's super interesting because this is like 1951 so pre-code horror comics that he's making then he continues to make comics later like he has another career and in the late 70s returns to making some comics believe he was the first comic book that fanographics published called flame of gyro 1979 uh he did a the comics that i have picked up in the quarter bins are lance corgan and captain electron they're captain electrons 1986 uh hashtag 1986 zine for everybody out there um lance corgan early 80s and then in the 2000s he did a color web comic for five years, like a hundred pages or more of this thing called Aeroc of Zenith. That's awesome, man. And he is really an interesting artist. It's very stylized, more stylized than even what you see in these samples. 
and definitely worth a, uh, a, a look. Kayfabers who might not be aware should check out this uh, Confessions of Robert Crumb uh, documentary. It was done several years before the Terry Zwagoff Criterion, you know, Crumb documentary. It's from 1988, and I think he might have still been living uh, in California at the time. But he shows off a bunch of uh, he shows off a bunch of J. Disbrow art like that. This is where you would first have heard of of the guy. And uh, the things that Crumb was working on at the time when he was really looking at uh, the Jay Disbrow stuff, if you remember the Philip K. Dick comic, and so, some of that other like very heavy black that makes noirish a lot of sense. Uh, material that he was doing in like late period uh, weirdo. And this pre-code horror stuff has a collection from IDW. I think it's Monsters Unleashed or Invasion or something. But you you know you find it if, if you look up Jay Dispro. Um, that stuff's available. Uh, can. These are sort of classic illustrators, um, you know, pen and ink magazine type illustrations, Thomas Natt, James Gilray, and he talks about their illustrative qualities. Yeah, and you know, this Crumb likes drawing, you know, like so Nast, one of the great cross hatchers of, <laughs> yes. of, of, of art, man, of illustration. Again, you see the style. Totally. You know, it, it makes total sense that that's, uh, that's somebody that, that has entered Crumb's, uh, Crumb's mind. And then we could like, spend less time on their own stuff because like we can handle that later it's it's more about getting into their mind yeah with, for with sure this conversation i feel like it is a great like interview format to do this cross-referencing though between influence and then pieces of history yeah. it really does uh, a good job of tracing their evolution and, and what they're looking at and thinking of and where they can find pl outlets for their work and great reproduction this was a, a wave of books where the reproduction like they started to get it Yes. You know, like they were reproducing from printed pieces in high quality scans and photographs, and it really started to show it off. Yeah, I think I think that's I think we have Chip Kid to thank for that. This is a guy that everybody likes, man. Uh, J Jim Woodring always posts this dude's work, man. That's and so Jim Woodring. I'm, I'm I'm showing my my ignorance or whatever, but yeah, well, you're you're do? putting me on the spot trying to pronounce <laughs> his name, Boris Artzibashev. Man, that's rough. I'm yeah. sure that's way off. But uh, as you say, Ed, this is an artist that we see his images float around. And when you say Woodring, it's that makes total sense. Both of these pieces by the same artist here. And that's from the 1940s. Uh, show poster and then S. Clay Wilson piece. So getting into some of his contemporaries in the underground comics and this is uh this is it's pretty great to see there's a few times when different artists will talk about these underground artists and how what they think of their work you know and how they describe them and that's amazing too like you could blow out any of these concepts into a full-on book or interview and i would read all of it yeah another underground guy this is rory hayes who has had a couple of collections printed since then he was like the young kid at the, in the underground circle, super talented, but also not quite on the same wavelength as everyone else, which I think made him interesting to everybody else, but also like weird comics, even within a world of weird comics. <laughs> Some of the young uh, jam comics and stuff when he, when he was a kid, man, with Char Charles Crumb. Oh no, that's, uh, so that's Sophie, that's his daughter's work. Oh, yeah, I didn't realize that. Wow, I overlooked that. That's that's super interesting. So this is when she was 11 or 12. That's amazing. <laughs> and it says uh, influenced by more by Charles' homemade comics at the time, which is even another Perfect. another uh, interesting... Childish rebellion. To think of that you would have access to that as a kid. And then some Charles Crumb work here, which, of course, you see in the documentary. And Eileen, his wife some of her comics work and they often collaborated. So you get some input or some, uh, probably a little bit nice, uh, uh, toned down maybe response or thoughts, reflections on, on Eileen's work. I don't know how honest you could be if you had a spouse or a partner that made comics. He's honest on the page. <laughs> yeah, I guess saying, so. Like, Hey man, she did the lighting wrong here. I think this was in the Pittsburgh biennial that year. I think so. I'm pretty sure I've seen that piece, uh, in person. Um, old music being influenced. I think we're all familiar with his uh, his love of old music, and it's record graphic, collecting, it's playing a, music. It's the graphic design of that piece too mm -hmm. that that has uh, inflected itself upon his work. Yeah, and also you know like Chris Ware, I think draws a lot from this this kind of uh, advertising and design. <clears throat> this is pretty neat. This is Crumb drawing after 
a um, Reginald Marsh painting, or I guess that's a painting, sure. painting or pastels, but you know, like like studying somebody else's art and, and drawing from it. Pretty neat. Compulsive graphomaniac, man. Like he, you know, I got a bunch of those sketchbooks where he just looks at things and and you know draws whatever he sees. Drawn and Quarterly put out, uh, you know, mm -hmm. these are like placemats and shit. They sort of dropped the ball because they could have created the artist edition. Mm. Drawn and Quarterly could have, you know, but they scanned in these placemats and stuff and sort of bumped up and took it took out the levels, man, and made it just a black and white line illustration. But, uh, man, it would have been cool if they would have kept all of that stuff because he was an abuser of the whiteout. Like, everything he draws, even if it's a placemat, at a restaurant, he puts white out <laughs> all so over weird. it and redraws over top of it. He just can't not do it. But then, you say it's weird, but then the fact that he could sell it for three thousand dollars makes it less weird, you know. That part is true, and also like it's it's that thing of uh, like athletes that practice hard, yeah, and then they're ready to play hard. Yeah, it's the same kind of deal. Like if this is how you work, this is how you work. Right. Um, these always blew my mind because this stuff, those drawn and quarterly collections were coming out. I don't know around this time, mm -hmm. give or yeah. take a little bit. But I come in contact with those, and then I'd just be wrecked. Like <laughs> I have no hope. This is the guy doing this while he's waiting on his soup or whatever. Right. Like I have no chance whatsoever. <laughs> These are always great too. Of course, the sketchbooks. You know, the the famous Robert Crumb sketchbook excerpts. I think these might be placemats. Actually, can't tell. It looks like this paper's kind of like the placemat weird paper, but at a bougie restaurant. That ain't no, that ain't no Basket Robbins, man. All right, next up is Art Spiegelman, of course, famous for Mouse and Raw Magazine. Certainly did a lot of other work. He did, a, there's a collection called Breakdowns, which yeah. uh, we should look at at some point, where it really kind of shows his more formal, investigative, interesting comics. Yeah, like his, it's his first period, like his early period. It has the, the first Mouse, which was done in 1972 or three. Um, yeah, we'll look at that. This is pretty interesting. This is from Art Forum 1990, and the reason I find it interesting is the mashed-up way he's putting different types of comics, his own work, together to create sort of a comic, but not a comic that looks neatly like a comic, and certainly not a comic that looks, say, like a 1930s Sunday page or something. Um, we would see more of this kind of stuff going forward with him, but it's not that different than what he was doing with breakdowns. The tools are probably, you know, continue to evolve, but that idea of uh, different styles and how you can create meaning out of that has been part of his work as long as I've known his work. And now we get into some of his stuff. Boy, the collections, Ed. No, I know. <laughs> Windsor McKay original uh, talks about, you know, the Nemo and the history of Windsor McKay. Um, this is Dream of the Rare Bit Fiend, another strip that Windsor McKay did early on. Windsor McKay always cited as, as being one of the early cartoonists that sort of figured out comics when it was in its infancy yes man and its legacy continues to live on harvey kurtzman yeah spiegelman was a uh, teacher at the sva uh, alongside will eisner and harvey kurtzman so i i wouldn't doubt that you know he made a deal while they were there teaching man yeah and really great so this is the the kurtzman layout and then or the kurtzman version and then the jack davis like refined version next to it those are always great to look at. You get some of that in the in that kitchen sink Kurtzman book, um, but these are always outstanding. And that's the, the second Kurtzman to pop up already. So we're two artists in, and we've gotten Kurtzman out of both of them. Here's some printmaking. So this is uh, he talks about how he has drawing isn't always for him, but doing this kind of drawing on the stone is much more. Um, he, he describes it as central, like drawing on velvet. So something that he enjoys more than, say, drawing in a more traditional way. And then some strips, Milton Kniff, Chester Gold, a couple Chester Gold pieces. The the most bizarre Chester Gold pieces he could find, too. Man. Like the most perverted, <laughs> sick, weirdo ones, man. Yeah, and, and guys talk about that, you know, as well. Chester Gold, cartoons for a long time. Like, uh, he goes through some, some different stages and... I think society goes through some... Maybe society is what changes and it sort of contextualizes these things in the way of like, wow, this is odd now. Here's a context that we could put it in that everybody can understand out there at home. So you've been sitting at home for a couple of weeks, right? Multiply that by 50 years and uh, and imagine like uh, where your mindset will be. <laughs> Very well. Well said, Ed. <laughs> Fletcher Hanks, boy. Fletcher Hanks, 
amazing cartoonist. Fanagraphics has put out uh, two volumes of his work. My first knowledge of Fletcher Hanks was in Raw Magazine. Yep. And he talks about that, you know, so Paul Karasik is the guy behind the Fanagraphics collections who, you know, work with, with Spiegelman, I guess, through Raw is yep. probably where those two got, got Karasik, together. Karasik was a student at SVA. And uh, gives credit to Jerry Moriarty for um, turning everybody on to Fletcher Hanks. So lots of cartoonists, you know, we all have these boxes of the weird stuff we like that maybe you don't know or whatever, and you're happy to show it, show it off. Fletcher Hanks is the one that seems to have connected everybody I know that looks at it, you respond to it. There's a real strange, a genuine strangeness about it and an auteur quality and, of course, totally outsider. Everything you just said can be said for Jerry Moriarty as well. So the <laughs> fact that he's mentioned there, uh, I believe uh, Chris Ware is going to mention him. And I know that Klaus has a cover or a page or two from Mil Moriarty. That's a he, important artist to the guys of this generation. That whole raw, uh, you know, like most of that raw crew... The, the core of it, yeah. it feels like they have this in common where like they're studying history, this history that most people aren't aware of. And in a lot of ways, what we know today comes from this group. They're almost like archaeologists or anthropologists or something going through the unknown comics history. And now it's more and more normal. Like here we go to Booty, Booty Rogers, another one of these cartoonists from, you know, 40s, 50s, who pretty obscure, did a little bit of comics and then disappeared brought back in raw and now there are collections of booty rogers comics available major influence on me because that that issue of raw that would be uh, volume two number two uh, at least the one that i know that's the one i've got okay um it uh in an era where image image comics is new computer coloring is new and everybody's trying to do their version of it they stripped things down and did traditional color separations on like an off-white yellowish paper and i'm like well i you could still do comics like that because, like, I had more comics like that than anything else. And it's like, well, when I grow up, I'm going to make some comics like that. You know what I mean? So it was that Booty Rogers piece that inspired me to do that. This is also Booty Rogers. So weird. This is a French magazine from the uh, very early 20th century. And I wondered if this is stuff that, um, that we saw on our tour after SPX. At, at, at Warren Bernard's place. And uh, that Robert Crumb book about cartooning, like one of the wings of the Warren Bernard collection is books about cartooning and studying cartooning and how to make comics yeah. and shit. So like we, we could probably dig that stuff out. It's really fascinating to hear hear him ruminate on like what was the scene at this time because so much good quality work was made then. And uh, one of the comments was Al Hirschfeld said no it was just cheap real estate i think about that all the time because like for a long time pittsburgh was cheap you know cheap place to live and i always wonder like is that connected you know like you can you can devote a lot of time to making your art and not as much time to you know you don't need as much time devoted to making your rent right. uh, which frees you up to make some art these are some rejected covers that ended up in different places. This ended up on on an issue of Comic Art magazine, yeah. or some version of this. Yeah, and that was that was a uh, rejected um, New Yorker New Yorker cover. How about that conversation in bed at that nightmare when your wife is like, "Nah." Yes. Yeah, speaking of your partners and how that that all works, you know what? One quick note: this is uh, this is around nine eleven, I believe, uh, two two thousand three. It looks like this is from uh, Shadow of No Towers. Still super relevant today. It's like we haven't changed much in you know in almost twenty years in terms of that that political divide. He might have even coined the the blue state red. St well, no, I think that was around George W. era. Some stuff from breakdowns, page from Mouse, more New Yorker work. And this is where he talks about uh, the tools that went into uh, making Mouse, and he he described that he just wanted to use like stationary like that you could find at the local uh 7-eleven so it's like typing paper it's like little felt tip pens that you could get uh that was that was always interesting to me man because the art style was just so different than any other comics when you looked at uh when you looked at mouse and i i had no info on how that stuff was made and it, this will obviously be expanded in that meta mouse book that will come out a year or two after this maybe yeah, it's a great point, Ed. I take that stuff for granted, but as somebody making comics, like when you find something that looks different, yeah. you really do start to ask yourself, well, why? Or how did he do it? Why did he do it? Why make this choice? And those things really, 
you know, they still, I still ask those questions whenever I'm putting together a project. It's important because when you discover that it's drawn on typing paper, uh, it lets you know that you don't have to abide by how to draw comics the Marvel way, which we may take for granted now, but back then it just felt like what you're supposed to do is what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to like work within this rigid system. You can't, you can't turn in something to Marvel that's, you know, not their proprietary sort, sort of format. And by the way, a, a page from Breakdowns where we see him showing off like various color separations and combinations and might be the original cover. Ah. Like, like and it's on a bunch of acetate. Interesting. It might be how that works. <clears throat> This is an early woodcut novel, so like a wordless graphic novel. Yeah. There are a few of those that are around. This is one that he cites, and the drawings are really interesting and spectacular. And stuff that he was referencing when he did Wild Party adaptation. All, all this stuff m makes me want to, like, ring Warren up and be like, dude, do you have this? Yeah, I bet, I bet Warren could source a lot of this let's stuff. Let's look at this further. <laughs> Even, like, the, the pull-out Sunday pages, Warren could probably produce several of these. Yeah. And again, that's exactly what these are, um, different Sunday pages that he's looking at and, Harold, and talking about, you know, various influences they have. Harold Gray's another influence on a lot of these guys. Yeah, the the, the people that we know, there's a reason you know them. There, there's a reason Annie and Dick Tracy and these comic strips are so well known. I'm going to say it right here, man. Jimmy, we're the new generation of that, man. So dust off your vigils <laughs> and bust out your team so far. <laughs> Harold Gray's rolling over in his grave when you put Tim Vigil, add Tim Vigil to the canon. <laughs> All right, Gary Panter, um, fascinating artist. Gary Panter's one of those guys that at first I was like, what? You know, you would hear everyone talk so highly of him, and it took me a little while to get it, and then once you get it, it's almost a wavelength. It is uh, a spectacular artist who's done a million things. Um, here's the Jimbo and Purgatory that we were talking about, like one panel a night he would draw. It's a beautiful oversized book if you've ever seen the actual book, but pulling in all sorts of an update of Dante, you know, of Dante. So okay. it's bringing in like a contemporary version of, of Dante's Inferno with all of these pop culture references, making appearances and, and Jimbo in the middle of it. Uh, Panter, one of the things that got him on, on, you know, that made sense to me was seeing his sketchbooks just draws all the time. Another guy like, like a crumb that draws all the time. And there would be excerpts of sketchbooks here and there. Sometimes they would be uh, reproduced occasionally. So we're going to see some of those in, in this. And, of course, I know him from Raw. That was probably the first stuff that I saw was, like, the Jimbo. I think Pantheon did, the like, the book collection. But I think a lot of that stuff came out of Raw magazine. There was there was the Pantheon one. There was the one shot that, that Raw actually put out. And then uh, the ones that I got hold of first would have been, like, the Zongo comics. Yes. You know, he, he came up early with uh, Matt Groening. Like, they famous conversations about them as, as kids talking about taking over American pop culture. Uh we know how Graining did it, and one of the ways that Gary Panter inflected his uh, his mania upon us was doing a lot of the d design work on Pee Wee's Playhouse. Yeah, three Emmys worth of uh, wow. work there. And that was, I think, a relatively small creative team. I think it was him and two other guys. Wayne White. Right. Who, uh, uh, famous had... painter now, documentaries about him and stuff. Very much worth uh, watching. Yeah, absolutely. And coming out of, like, punk being an influence and he talks about punk and sort of the influence that had on him and the community that he found there. It's interesting thinking that you go back because uh, you just think about the ping pong effect of art of comics. Uh, this is LA publication. Um, young Jaime Hernandez probably saw this shit. You know what I'm saying? And, and that creates a situation where, where it's like, Oh, well I could make more comics like this. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a good point. I'd for sure. Um, Especially back then when it was like, you're, you're sort of limited. You know, Very it's not limited. like you're looking through a Google image search. <laughs> it's like you it's have... the magazine that happens to show up, you know, on your block. And uh, if it has a Gary Panther cover, it's going gonna, it's gonna to leave an impression for sure. And then some of, uh, some of the, I guess, commercial work that he would do, you know, some additional covers here. The painting on Glenn Bray's wall. <laughs> it, it's, it's so funny when you see that right there and you see like... The influence that shit like this has on people around our generation who, like, superficially pull from this. They do almost like the Alex Saviuk, Jim Lee interpretation of, uh, <laughs> of like, you know, this Gary Panther shit. These are Dow Tokyo strips. Yeah. I guess those are published in Japan? I don't know that, man, because, I mean, it's in English, right? Um... 
Oh yeah, I guess it is. You know what they do? They, they It was a Japanese reggae magazine called Rhythm. There is an incredible collection of this. I think yes. Fanographics put it out. It's oversized, but it's like the, you know, it's they're strips. So it's like this giant landscape format. And I think it came out like the same day as Building Stories or something. It was completely overshadowed by another release. <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that, man, because uh, I, I'm quite sure that you know, I was up for like a design Eisner or something against Del Tokyo <laughs> and building stories. And, you know, <laughs> there I, you go. I think, but you know what I think one, because it is the Eisner's, the uh, Mazzy Kelly artist edition for born again, which is I'll good. take that. I was going to say like, like usually it's heartbreaking whenever it, you start the sentence that way. It but was that, the one that's time, not bad. It was the one time where I was happy to, and uh, accepted the loss. Uh, but it's a great reproduction because they are reproduced large. So yeah. it's a really nice showcase of Gary Panter artwork. Probably the size of the originals. And he mentions the um, the situationists here. And so I, I thought I would just uh, very quickly m mention a little tie to them. So I know them from Society of the Spectacle, one of uh, Guy Debord's famous situationist books. And I was turned on to it by John P. And it's a critique of advanced capitalism is basically the situ situationist. It's the idea that we've traded a real experience for things like an object or uh, an approximation of it, you know, a surrogate experience. So watching a movie, for instance, watching Netflix, for instance, right, would be separating us from the real experience, but we're happy to trade that off for a, a little more wealth, uh, maybe a little easier existence, maybe a few extra things in our house. And I feel like it's more relevant now. It's as relevant now as whenever they started writing about this stuff in the 60s. So if you're, uh, if you're dealing with um, uh, social alienation right now, <laughs> This is maybe on topic. Maybe it's too on topic and you don't want to read it, but uh, <laughs> it did seem relevant to me. Shit, just, th just think about all of that in the context of like the creation of the iPhone and how people take selfies at like ground zero. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect illustration of it. But it speaks to Gary Panter and just the stuff that's going into his head that's then coming out in these pages and drawings and characters. The stuff that I learned from like the great artists in comics is that you really the the great ones really do separate themselves from from contemporary culture and have that ability to look at it from the outside, man. To the to the um sort of exclusion of their social lives and shit like that, man. Uh, you might not be the now. I think Gary Panther's a super cool guy. I got dinner with him before and all that, but. Uh, when you get deep down that rabbit hole, you might not be a fun person to talk to at parties. That that could be. That could be. It's important to kind of stay aware of that, I think, for your own personal health. Uh, referencing some of the influence of various Japanese artists, printmakers, and things on his work uh, in this in this section. These old kitsch magazines <clears throat> are a big part of a uh, big influence on these guys, and and you could imagine when uh, there was no internet, there was very little weirdo shit that you could get your hands on that that everybody wasn't picking up or whatever man and, and famous monsters of filmland seems to be uh where a consortium of future creatives kind of like got a lot of inspiration stephen king talks about it a lot john waters talks yeah. about it a lot so uh the misfits logo comes from a high contrast photo of the crimson ghost from famous monsters they the misfits had an album called famous monsters so very very important forrest ackerman rest in peace and and he starts out i don't know why boys like monsters <laughs> it's it's the perfect introduction because we all do <laughs> he was doing light shows for a while so this is a little bit of that uh some background on that we, multimedia we, we might have to get him uh, on on the hook, man, for a for a shoot interview. I think I can make that happen. Yeah, this is a collaboration with Savage Pencil, an, another another graphic artist, and uh, we've talked about collaboration and what makes for a good collaboration. So here he writes a little bit about it, and uh, his rule is to say yes as much as possible, which is improv one hundred and one. You know, it's the idea that it keeps it going. You know, just keep pushing that ball along. Don't stop it. You know, don't stop it with a no. Uh, but I do think that's interesting for cartoonists to think in those terms. Because so much, you know, a lot of these comics, a lot of these boxes of comics around us are the, the end result of collaboration. So figuring out how that works. I even think of collaborations with, like, the publishers I work with. So it's not always writer artist. There's a lot of ways those collaborations work. This is a great piece. This is him ruminating on Jack Kirby a little bit. But this piece appeared in the New Yorker magazine. I have it framed on my wall from the New Yorker magazine just because I love it. And it's like this distillation of Jack Kirby and you know, the, the visual iconography of Jack Kirby. Um, I don't know what he did this for. It appeared right after Jack Kirby died in the New Yorker as like a memorial. So I don't know if it was done for that or if it was just used for that uh, because it made sense. Uh, Jesse Marsh Tarzan. Yeah. So, so it's because it's like, it's so wrong 
but still fun to look at. Yeah, and there's a great collection of these that Dark Horse put out that is like three inches thick on uncoated paper. It's a really nice addition. Um, here are Gary Panter's notes on the underground artist. And again, it's just insightful to read, like, what are these guys bringing? What are the skills? That, that he would give a fuck about Russ Manning. Because, like, oh, like interesting. When, yeah. when, you, when you look at his work, uh, a very clinical kind of Russ Manning style of artwork, and honestly, Jesse Marsh, for that matter, I wouldn't associate either of those with his stuff. Both of those guys, Manning and Marsh, are both that California West Coast cartoonist. Yeah. Uh, Toth is mentioned in here by somebody, and I didn't flag it, but the idea that part of Toth's movement to the West is because he liked these kind of artists uh, might be high, maybe. Yeah, I wouldn't it. doubt if it was high. Um, but there was like a style, you know, it's not a house style because they're just around LA, but there is some commonality to it. And a lot of those artists are celebrated. Russ Manning, you know, very celebrated. Um, over the years, Russ Manning Award at the Eisners for uh, good draftsman, good top, young draftsman. Top of the family tree of many cartoonists, man. Dave Stevens, William Stout, several people like worked underneath him. But this is very great stuff. S. Clay Wilson takes you to that junior high school place, <laughs> but Williams takes you to a really scary place. <laughs> it's it's uh, it's fun fun insight. Um, all those guys, and he mentions Alex Toth from cartoons as being a fan of of his. That's Car tunes yeah the, the drag strip comics and stuff i think we saw this asshole mini comic in jason hamlin's collection so you know besides doing all this stuff that you see him doing from tv shows to light shows uh he's even like making mini comics and things whenever he's not making books of comics and these are some of his like sketchbook covers which are really great if you find a photo of that that's worth a google search because he decorates those his sketchbooks start on the outside and these are some spreads and stuff from some sketchbooks and then the uh the picture box sketchbooks would, would, would come after this you know like like this the hignite curation spawns so much other material yeah some stuff on Pee Wee's playhouse is really cool to see yeah it's it's neat to see a guy whose style is so unique you know so unique and idiosyncratic but also works whenever it's put in front of a mass audience like it really connects there's a primal quality to his work uh that i think people do respond to instantaneously all right charles burns um this is this even the way this book is curated is awesome because panter a little looser a little bit more a little bit more um, sort of it on the page. And now we got a clinical drawer. Yeah. And those two have collaborated on things like face gasm. Look at this shit, man. This is one of my favorite things uh, that I've ever seen. This is a collection of Burns' father's books where he would cut out like the same types of images from comics, paste them into this book. I guess his father was a little bit of an armchair cartoonist. And yeah. so this was reference. But ama- like I would, I would pay for these in a second. I would love these books. And just take a fucking look at it, and you and look at any piece of Charles Burns' work. You see where his work comes from. So what you were you're seeing right there really is an illustration of what of the comic book version of the Malcolm Gladwell outlier. If you start off at this position where your pops is not uh, putting bad logic in your mind about being an artist or growing up to draw comics, and he has this as reference. Like, my dad could draw a reasonable Popeye, and that, to me, like, blew my mind when I was a kid, man. But if I had that, fuck, man, we would be ten years ahead of where we are now. They're even labeled in the margins, like, um, a quarter shot, a half shot, full, uh, front profile, reverse. Like It's it's it's, <laughs> it's anal retentive, and so that was a, g- a genetic uh, predisposition <laughs> that, uh, that Burns accumulated himself. I love these, though, man. I, they're so great. Sixth grade art, always fun to see like the the young young artwork. Will Elder, so another Mad Magazine, you know, EC artist reference. And his first works were these. Uh, he called them coloring books, and he would just do these big illustrations and probably print them on the real shitty fucking awesome uh, pulpy paper that just doesn't exist anymore. He, he calls it crappiest newsprint paper he could find. It just doesn't exist. <laughs> it anymore. doesn't. It doesn't. I'll find old paper sometimes, like at flea markets or garage sales. And it's such a different quality. Some of his early strips, this was uh, submission stuff he was trying to get into newspapers. 
I wonder uh, like why it didn't like alt, work alt newspaper. Some of it did run. It, it eventually ran in the Rock at a free monthly paper that came out of Seattle. He was trying to get it in Village Voice, and then uh, showing swipes that he found where it's like all the same, and then his version of it. Everybody's an expert, and everybody's a fucking <laughs> archaeologist. They man. are. They are. Seeing some of his originals, mind bending, and now of course we have an artist edition of Black Hole of his work. So really incredible. This was from a. I believe this became a book that Drawn and Quarterly, I want to say, published where it was like photographs of his juxtaposed two photographs together, I think, at, at the halfway point. And the reason I mention that and think it's interesting, that's like early digital photography for him. This is from one of his early comics. It's called The Catwoman Returns and it's Fumetti that he made at, way before digital. You know, I don't know when this was done, probably maybe in the 70s. He said he was looking at a lot of Mexican comics, Fumetti comics. This comic appears in Taboo number six. Oh, cool. So I am trying to track that down before we make this video live because I want it. It's like a 20-page comic. Early paintings. I remember getting, enter this is from Entertainment Weekly. I remember getting this issue like before I probably even realized exactly who Burns. I, I probably knew of Burns, but like 1995 was before I was really into all of this stuff. But I can remember this was the model. It's like you make your money off the Entertainment Weekly illustration, then you get to go do Black Hole. Exactly. I saw I saw this. Um, a teacher would have a stack of Entertainment Weeklies in high school, man. So 95, I was in like, you know, like a ninth, ninth grade or something like that. Uh, eight, eighth grade. And uh, that was the model. And the little bit that I read with Charles Burns from that period, it mentioned that he was a professional illustrator. And there's, it might even show it in here, the Iggy Pop album cover. But uh, there would be such few and far between shit that you and I would see or be able to identify as Charles Burns. So I remember thinking, like, does he draw comic uh, coloring books? Or, or, like, does he draw... If I go to Target, am I going to see fucking <laughs> right. birthday cards? That looks suspiciously like <laughs> Charles Burns. <laughs> How nightmarish would a birthday card, <laughs> greeting card by Charles Burns be? It'd be incredible. I was always confused by this because it's about the Crumb movie. And it was like, why didn't Crumb, why isn't it Crumb art? It was always confusing to me in the context of the actual article. Um, these are, you know, some of his sketchbook drawings that he would do like at his daughter's, you know, piano lessons while he waited, he would sit there and draw and it, they'd be based on some other existing drawing, sometimes his own, you know, it'd be like several iterations uh, and they were reproduced in Close Your Eyes. Yeah. He has several of these books that are, they go out of print almost instantly. Um, I have a copy of this we could look at at some point. That's Blaine Ventura, right? They, they they only published a couple. I don't know if it was. It may have been. They definitely published a few of those. And I have one, at least one Burns, one Ventura publication that we should also look at uh, at some point. But he does stuff with European publishers as well. And then this is the famous inking thing from the Marvel tryout. This floats around online sometimes and is very fun. The yes. Marvel tryout book as inked by uh, Charles Burns. And then some vinyl toy designs. Uh, again, famous monsters popping up, of course. He's all that kitschy pop culture, you know. Outer Limits was a big influence. It's really neat to see their stuff translated into these different different things yeah and, and this is like you know the aurora model garage model kits man that would have been advertised in like old warren magazines and famous monsters you know uh, uh creature from the black lagoon F frankenstein all of that shit there's a lot of good process stuff in here so yes. we're gonna see a little bit of uh like like this was huge for me is watching the development of this cover and at one point he flip you know like he flips it to kind yeah. of check and that's something artists will often do hold it up to a mirror and you'll see if like an eyeball isn't lined up right or whatever but he would do these iterations on you know like tracing paper i guess uh working his way up and this is the book i have from one aventura that reproduces a bunch of these like preparatory sketches and pencil drawings and stuff it looks painful like like if when i try to like pretty hop, intense. hop into the, to his mindset it it seems uh it seems scary almost man to like work something that tight and he does a lot of this rework redoing like an old found panel but in his style even keeping the text because uh in his words it's perfect already <laughs> this always uh piqued my curiosity he would he would do these little xerox what would be like a mini comic format or zine that he would give out at shows and appearances and just for free, you know, free shit. And then finally, Fanographics just put out a collection of this, uh, I think, last year. Yep. Now, this is the kind of stuff where you get a heart attack and you die and your family's cleaning out your your your, your house. <laughs> and they find this. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's some questions. Is that, uh, let's call that a red herring, man, that you do just to fuck with your friends. Because that is Plant some, those. That's some Kevin Spacey 7 type shit. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Underground comics and influence. Somebody sent us this in a, in a package of... Uh, 
mystery box stuff. Really? Yeah. This one? Yeah. That's cool. Yeah, I always yeah, like cool. like these are some of the weirdest ones, right? And he and he describes that too as like these are some of the outstanding ones where it's like that's not even like language the title of that one <laughs> it's a very hard one to ebay search it's great though the underground stuff is such a weird it's it's like the 80s black and white you know the yeah, weird totally, stuff yeah there, before that 20 years before one issue of things man a cartoonist does does one and you know they don't become robert crumb so they fucking go away become square you see this shit and it's like of course this is charles burns yeah yeah, and that's another one of those, like, there weren't that many options. Yeah. So if you're a certain age, you all watch the same movies or the one weird sci-fi show, uh, you're Dick Tracy, the, the Chester Gold Dick Tracy that has to make an appearance. And that makes perfect sense, too, with that slick, clean uh, ink line. I always think that, yeah. A good uh, companion piece to this would be um, would be Steve Stephen King's Dance Macabre, but like, for the cartoonists yeah. of similar age, because it's like they... It just bolsters the fact that they really were all looking at the same stuff. There just wasn't that much counterculture until the people of this generation, like, created, or, you know, the crumb generation, will say, created true counterculture. All right. Jaime Hernandez. We saw this strip in the first issue of comic art, reproduced here. Jaime, of course, you know, one of the great... All these cartoonists are legit. Like, this, these are top-shelf cartoonists that we're looking at. Of course, Jaime... Uh, long long history is kind of if you think of crumb as underground i always think of love and rockets as the alternative right it's sort of the ground zero of the alternative comics i was talking to uh to him at one point and it's like between the two you know he and gilbert they're almost like the jack kirby in terms of influence you know it's a, it's so much language that they introduced to comics so love seeing his originals and again now we have a studio edition that reproduces a bunch of his originals at size so it's kind of amazing like this book is almost a blueprint for the next two decades of, of publishing at least in alternative and art comics for sure man and, and you know he he he'll do a lot he'll do several versions of pages and panels and he'll have false starts and throw that stuff away and uh this is one of those places where you get to see a lot of that early stuff. Chester Square and Wigwam Bam were like my kind of my starting points for reading. That, that's when I enter like Love and Rockets was picking up those collections around that time. I might have had a, an issue here or there before that, but that's whenever I really got in. Some of the uh, some of the flyers that he would make for punk shows, um, 82, this, 83. Yeah, and that's is that Pettibone? Raymond Pettibone. Um, I think this one is Gary Panter and then Jaime. And I'm not sure this bottom one. I think that might be Jaime as well. So, you know, part of that scene of like that punk culture in the L.A. area, you know, the contemporary artists that were part of that. I have a um, a collection of those flyers called Fucked Up and Photocopied. And he's in there a lot, along with, you know, Pettibone. There might be a little bit of panner in there, but definitely part of that scene. There it is, man. The back of Nervous Breakdown, which I recommend everybody listen to if, if they need to get their blood flow in while they're inking comics or something. And then you see the direct influence right there man i i honestly don't think black flag would be anything uh if it wasn't for the visual component of, of petty bone man like like that four squared black flag like offset you know four square yeah image man that they painted all over uh la right that was the best advertising one of the all-time greatest comic book covers ever made yeah <laughs> brilliant and, and just as a piece of graphic design the two color just genius best wrestling comics there are fun to see a little bit of the wrestling influence that's something that comes through and like glenn bray is also a wrestling collector i think wrestling has a bigger and bigger influence uh it's weird that it's like a shameful part of the influence on a lot of pop culture and lowbrow culture but i think it's you see more and more of it and then the hernandez brothers were some of the early cartoonists that i would see pointing out some of the archie guys that were uh you know worth looking at bob bowling being shown here and then the jaime sort of influence of that in Jaime's work, especially with the, the kid the kid stuff that he does sometimes. And then the other Archie guy is Harry Lucy, which, again, there have been a couple collections of Harry Lucy Archie comics have been published since then by Dark Horse Comics. Yeah, check the uh, Jaime uh, shoot interview that we did because one of the questions I had was like, well, how do you know, like, how did you discover the name of the guy? And, and uh, he said that he and Gilbert were sort of on the quest to try to figure out the guy for a long time and and tells the story of of uh bill sinkevich like coming up to jaime like while they're in the urinal <laughs> at San Diego comic con it was like trying to give him some scoop on the name of the guy and actually gave him the wrong name that's so funny 
I think everybody that's, that digs has had that experience too, where you think you know who you're looking for and it's wrong. And you just, you probably are finding them over and over, but it's not who you were looking for. And it just seems like you're off. Um, Owen Fitzgerald, uh, a Dennis the Menace cartoonist, not one I'm familiar with, uh, but, but Dennis the Menace, one of those early comics that the Hernandez brothers would get their bag of comics in the summer or whatever. And they would talk about Dennis the Menace and sort of the, the life in those comics and the backgrounds, things would be happening. I always love hearing those guys talk about that. And Jaime talks about Owens Fit- Fitzgerald specifically in that shooting interview, man. So make sure you guys yeah. check that out. Um, and you've dove, uh, you, you've gone back issue diving with Jaime. So like he is, he is into, com- you know, he's a comics lover. He's like got it's the a, list, it's man. He, DNA. He pull, he pulls out his fucking notebook paper list of comics he he's looking for, man. That's so much fun. Uh, talks about Kirby in this in this passage. Uh, Panther has a passage about Kirby. Alex Toth, uh, some information about Alex Toth. And I think this is where he talks about Toth moving to California partially to be around these artists that he liked. Oh, interesting. Criterion Collection. This is a spot illustration that I just find beautiful. Mm-hmm. And and he's kind of dismissive of it. You know, like, you do it for money. You know, it's freelance illustration. But it's such a good illustration. It, it is. And so is that Criterion piece. Uh, but But I have seen... A piece or two that that Jaime did, a couple album covers, man, where it's like, yeah, that's definitely Jaime, but man, he, hey, he drew with his other hand. Sometimes that's the uh, the art. You just can't overcome a, a bad art director. That's the truth. Uh, Roy Crane. There it is. Yeah, man. Ground Zero. Spot illustrations that would be in the comics journal. You get those old comics journals. You you never know what you're gonna find in there, man. And there's a lot of uh, Gilbert and Jaime. Uh, fan art where they're drawing Marvel DC characters, which is amazing to think. <laughs> Frank Miller said that he created, you know, the the little Robin girl from uh, every ten issues of Love and Rockets. They would have a sketchbook a supplemental section, and he drew like Maggie or Hopi as uh, yeah. as Robin, and seemed to work. Dan Klaus. So we showed off a little snippet of this in the uh, in that issue one of comic art. This is reformatted. It's a little bit different. Same concept, of course, um, but upgraded a little bit, too. I think Ice Haven might be newer. Um, it says 2001, but I feel like Ice Haven wasn't in the original batch. So a few of these things are changed around. Mad Magazine, of course, very common. Dan Klaus, uh, more of a DC Comics fan, sort of the weird Silver Age DC Comics stuff, and so that's pointed out here. He talks about it pretty deep in his Mark Marin interview, worth checking out. Yeah, it's no secret uh, that the influence of that stuff. This is funny. This is a convention sketch, and he talks about drawing these like to discourage people from asking for them. Yeah, and, he, and he's like, <laughs> he, and he's like, he's like, who the fuck ever like made it okay to even do that? And I, I actually, uh, I agree. I'm, I'm, I'm on board with but, that. Blame the Europeans, right? They do those elaborate uh, t- tipping drawings and stuff. Yeah. Um, man, is this an iconic page? And this went through eBay, I believe around this time maybe i remember looking at this on online and just being like that's the crowd god i gotta win this auction and of gonna, course i had no shot at you it you're gonna beat glenn bray man <laughs> um these are fun these are paperback like sci-fi paperback this was these were produced in such high numbers that like this was a real viable outlet for freelance designers and artists and so you would see some really great stuff come through the paperback cover and, and he, of course there's collectors of that stuff and i think he has a spinner rack he does with the paperbacks and and he says in many interviews uh, that he doesn't never even read them he just yeah. he just grabs them for the lettering and cool covers same with the album his album collection like he gets it for the oddness of the of the uh, art these are Ballantines, by the way. So whenever we hear about Tundra hooking up with Ian Ballantine, these, you know, this is part of his claim to fame right here. And certainly the book market. And then some of the weird ephemera that he's uh, influenced by. Owns the original art to that right now, man. Ba- Basil Gogos, another guy who also painted covers for uh, Famous Monsters of Film Land. Yeah, I was going to say, that's what it, it, it reminds me so much. That style's exactly in line. And then, of course, this is your uh, Dr. Peculiar, Ken Langriff. Hello World. John Jacobs works. Yeah. And we will look at this. Like I've been I've been prepping for that. So he's he's highlighted out. this page <laughs> in Why? interviews so many times, man. Like like even on uh the 
I think the anti gravity room, the the uh, sci fi channel show in the nineties, like when they're going through his collection, he like pulls this thing out, man. It's just talking about the subliminal kind of uh, imagery, the you know hardcore Christian comics. Exactly. That's that's part of why the <laughs> the uh, compositions are so much fun. It's they're so strange these comics, and that's uh, this is another page from it where he's redone it as a piece of art, uh, you know, a little painting drawing. This has always struck me as a fun a fun drawing and i was surprised that it comes from something like you know it's just him picking this up yeah uh and the the language that he has around this part of it at least in the comic art uh magazine it was sort of liberating to me because i don't uh constantly draw in sketchbooks and uh him just saying that he doesn't either you know like not yeah. everybody is our chrome and up to that point i just assumed everybody was I always regretted, uh, this came out at a MoCA one year when I was there, yeah. and I did not buy the print, and I should have. Sure. <laughs> I always regret that. But I do love that black cover that he ended up going with instead of the uh, like the panel, the multi-panel version. Yeah, it's Roy so Crane. Alien. Cool to see Roy Crane in color because we see him, uh, I can't remember now if it was Jaime or Charles Burns, Jaime. but it was in the black, you know, a black and white example. This is the first time I was exposed to Crockett Johnson's Barnaby. Right. Uh, a strip that's gained, you know, gained some prominence and been shown off more. I always think of it because of the weird Futura lettering. Yeah. Jack Bilbo, I've looked up this magazine several times. So this is an artist, um, I think this is from the 40s, but would show in galleries and stuff. And then this is Klaus recreating one of his drawings as a painting. And it's just the, you know, an interesting visual artist, the guy who's pulling out of his subconscious sort of these surreal-like images uh, amazing looking at a Jaime page and talking about how it works. And at this size, you get to see sort of the balance of the blacks and the way they're, you know, they balance top, top right, bottom left. Amazing, amazing page. And uh, Garrett Price. So he did White Boy and Skull Valley. White Boy has since been reproduced in a big edition, I think, by Sunday Press, which was one of those um, comic strips that was celebrated but wasn't widely available, hard to come by for a while. These were done by a kid in his school. Yes, he sh he shows those off. He, <laughs> Super strange. He, that he even has them. He shows those off, and he and uh, he describes. He talks about how he like got them um, because he was like the kid who drew, and these those comics were like vestiges that like a teacher held on to, and he has to borrow it, and then just never gave it back. And, so and, he stole them, and you get to see some <laughs> interiors. Uh, I it's the the interview is on YouTube. I I think it's a. Uh, I think it's the uh, anti-gravity room. Uh, Otto Soglo, Little King. I have this that at some point we're probably going to look at, but it has examples of stuff, and this is Otto uh, Soglo uh, examples. Yeah, I have a big-ass uh, Little King uh, Sunday collection. It's freaking awesome. And then this was, Chester Brown drew this in the back of, I think, Yummy Fur, and then, and then gave it to Dan Klaus, which is awesome, because it's a reproduction of issue one of eight balls cover but just a little drawing by chester brown that's so cool man throw a big mat on that and frame it it'd be amazing right uh bernie kriegstein probably my favorite of the ec guys love his drawing whenever i got into kriegstein when fanographics reproduced those books instantly you realize like that's a giant chunk of the dan Klaus puzzle sure and, and it's there's a certain part of uh Klaus career where you could see it more than others man yeah. like like the the prime cuts strips that he did back in the day a lot of uh, Kriegstein energy. Amazing artist. And then, of course, the kayfabe of Klaus. Like, he he w would be asked in Blab and stuff, do you like uh, Kriegstein? He'd be like, never even saw Kriegstein, <laughs> man. And he would say that. <laughs> and, and, and it would be in there just being a dick. Uh, Archie Pruitt, soft boy. I don't know what else Archie Pruitt has done. I think it's Archer. Archer, I'm sorry. Archer Pruitt. Uh, but I have these comics, and we should maybe look at them at some point because they're very peculiar. And he kind of draw calls out the drawing ability mm -hmm. because these are not drawn very big at all but there's all this amazing detail around them and then juxtaposed against your cartoonish uh character main character yeah no secret when you look at that that uh, archer pruitt is is very uh popular in japan and uh at the time he was you know just another one of the chicago guys steve ditko which i think we all know you know influence on on a lot of people but definitely on dan clouds as well Seth, the cover artist of comic art number one. I like Seth's art a lot. I'm yeah. not as a big of a fan. I, I haven't read as much of his work. Uh, it doesn't speak to me the way some of these guys do. 
but as an artist, I really love his art. Oh, yeah. Like, it's so beautiful. And then he teases us with this stuff. Like, he apparently has a trunk full of, like, you know, his childhood superhero comics. Man, I'd love to read those things. But he'll make covers for stuff, uh, you know, his own comics or... Like, this is Funny Book Info Guide. This was an Overstreet comic that he redid, like, the cover and end pages for, just, just for, you know, just for himself. This was, this, see, Love this, it. Is, this is what everybody remembers. Yes. Because I think this is probably most of our first times that we're, where we learn that he sort of builds Palookaville yes. in, in a practical format. And it looks cool, man. It looks like his art, you know, the it way does. he decorates those buildings. I love all that stuff. You know, Ed, you, you mentioned earlier these guys, they're like these historians and they're experts. Seth, the same way. Like, there's just a certain design era that he's into, illustration style, and he nails it. It's amazing. And I think those uh, <clears throat> those models and dioramas he's made have, have floated around and had art shows yeah. a, a, around them and everything, man. Uh, some of the stuff that, like, the sort of tightness of his Palookavilles, like, it sort of, it takes a lot of the life out of uh, the, mm -hmm. the strips, uh, to my taste. But when he did those, like, Wimbledon Green and those, those are, like, the best. And, and they it's are, like, yeah. And, like, you never want to tell a guy that because I think he talks about, like, you know, I made this in six months. And I'm like, this might be the way to go, man. Yeah, you know, we're not always the best judge of that. And also, different people are going to respond to different pieces. But I agree with you. Like, this stuff was amazing. Whenever it came out, I really enjoyed it. And then there's a bunch of these things, which are, like, book design mock-ups and stuff. So he must do a fair amount of that. Of uh, you know, like there, you know, you get to see the mock up and then like the finished piece. Yeah, he's not a he's not as sling like as you can imagine <clears throat> with his uh, dislike of modernity. Uh, when he designed the uh, the uh, peanuts books, yeah, he basically sent he sends Fantagraphics just like the dummy, you know, just this big messy bundle of pages. Yes, and these are some of the some of the setups for that some of the sketching and the mock-ups they're it's it's amazing like it's such a strong aesthetic but all of these mock-ups they remind me a little bit of some of like the chris ware stuff that we would see him building dummies of his books and they these guys probably inform one another like sure. one of them sees the other guy has a better dummy so then they have to go back to work but the payoff like since they do reproduce them here is you get to see these beautiful amazing pieces it's something to think if they weren't shown you know in this book it's like man he just has a like a house full of this amazing stuff that nobody sees John Stanley, uh, 13 going on, 18. Love John Stanley. I like this series. John and Quarterly did a big collection of this. Not complete, but uh, it's it's great cartooning. And yeah, John Stanley all over a lot your, of different good books. Get your hands on any of these. Little Lulu comics are really uh, fun reads. Then Doug Wright. So there's Doug Wright Awards at TCAF, Canadian Comics Art Award. And uh, I think Seth had a big hand in that, You know, again, as the historian. So these are some examples of Doug Wright, who, and they all look great. And there's been some collections of Doug Wright since then. So used to be you would see Seth talk about them at the TCAF Awards, and now there are collections of that stuff that you can track down. This is Jimmy Fries, which I think is another Canadian uh, cartoonist, not, not someone I'm familiar with, but again, highlighting his influences and in proud Canadian. That magazine-era illustration work influence, I think, on, a, on probably a couple generations of artists. I love this stuff where you can do a complete illustration and there's no ground line. There's no like room background. It's just all you need is the guy in the chair and the TV. Right. I would like to get better at that kind of thing because it's storytelling. There's your Wimbledon green and, uh, you know, mock-ups for that. Yeah. It's the end papers and, and some of the looser cartooning that you're talking about. I think he did it in a sketchbook you said, right? I yeah. think that was the story. Yeah. yeah. That, that's a, that's a fun, fun comic to read. Uh, Chris Ware, We've seen, obviously, Chris Ware, Superstar. Lots of stuff has been reprinted went with him. The, went through the monologue. So the real interesting thing that, to, to see would, I guess, be his influential materials. But even still, the monologue that comes 20 years after this is... This was one... The, the one piece I flagged, he's a big Frank King fan. And so this he has a couple pieces of Frank King artwork and talks about you know the meaning of Frank King in his, in, in his life, his work. But this piece... Uh, extremely disturbing it's one of king's last christmas cards and frightening and that it's clear he'd lost his ability to draw in fact there's little indication here that he ever knew how to draw it's very strange and sad to me i only found out recently from his granddaughter that he died of alzheimer's uh, which explains it i guess this is one of the scariest things ever mm -hmm. and it made me think like you know how you you hear people uh with dementia or alzheimer's they have good days and bad days 
I wonder on certain days if he could draw. And on right. some days, it's like he had forgot how to construct figures. I was trying to explain this to my wife. And, like, you know, like you'll see artists that lose the physical parts. So maybe their line's shaky, but they still understand composition. Right. You know, it'd be akin to drawing with your left hand. You understand how to compose the figure. But to lose that is, uh, it, you know, as an artist, that's very scary. It is scary. And, and, I, I, and I sort of trick myself into thinking that if I just keep my brain exercised and keep working and grinding, that I will stave off. Uh, any of that but this guy has worked uh, far longer and harder than me and and he wasn't able to but maybe uh modern medicine can do yeah something. and and the takeaway is you know just appreciate this present when you can draw because who knows you know getting a car accident on the way home or something so it's life is short and, and enjoy the, the good moments while it, while it lasts uh and this is some frank king advice po uh, young artists keep pocket notebooks and draw constantly pretty good advice it's cool to see several of these artists that have their, like, reprint projects, too. Yeah. So Frank King, Walton Skizix, uh, he did with Drawn and Quarterly, and then a bunch of these crazy and Ignatz collections. And some of these covers, for my money, are just, like, some of my favorite Chris Ware. Really outstanding stuff. Another Japanese comics reference, and I believe that there was a collection of this stuff done. I have it. Yeah. Yeah, we could show that off at some point, man. Uh, translated by Press Pop. Yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to take a look at that because he puts it, uh, you know, this. he says it's along with Harriman, Frank King, and Charles Schultz, his fourth favorite cartoonist, who's no longer alive, uh, definitely worth worth looking at. Yeah, it, it, it's worth looking at for a lot of reasons, and one of the other reasons is because this is pre tezuka manga. Yeah, look at the color, too. Like, the way the colors are built. Using some Japanese techniques. Comics there. just don't look like that. You yeah. know, like, I don't know if you're hand-cutting seps or what, but outstanding. Mark Smeets, I think a collection of his work has been published um, since, or, or at least excerpts have appeared in some other places like a Gansfield or somewhere like that. It really is the, uh, you could just go through and write down like all these guys. It's and, marching and do deep, orders, man. Deep dives. This is marching orders. Why, why not look at the works of uh, your favorite cartoonists' influences? Drawings by his grandfather, 1913 and 1973, 60 years later. Pretty cool. You gotta save those drawings your dad does, Ed. Yeah, right. The serviceable drawings your dad does. Richard McGuire, I'm a big fan of. I think most of us know him from here, uh, an influential comic that appeared in Raw, mm -hmm. but he's done a lot of stuff. That Fears of the Dark animated movie that had Charles Burns and a few other cartoonists in it, the Richard McGuire piece in it is the winner in that in that movie by far. Like, go see that thing. It is uh, it is amazing visually. Another Renaissance man, too. Man was in a band called Liquid Liquid, fav uh, famous song called Cavern, which would be uh, the White Lines theme done by Grandmaster Millie Mill and Duran Duran. This is that studio model from the monograph book, the Chris Ware monograph book, photographed much better in the Chris Ware monograph book. Yes. They did improve on that that the, part. The idea was his grandma couldn't come out to visit him, so he built a model of his house, of his room to show her. Some Henry Darger. So outsider artist in Chicago dies, and they uncover a lifetime's worth of work in his little tiny apartment in Chicago. There have been documentaries and books made about that. He did some stuff for a documentary, like some animated sequence or title, title art or something, and uh, I, I believe... And so he got connected to one of the documentary filmmakers that let he got to see Henry Darger's apartment before it was all, you know, taken apart. Yeah, and if I'm correct, that's amazing. Uh, Henry Darger was a uh, just like a janitor at like a school or something. Yeah, yeah a goodwill hunting kind of thing. A very isolated, lonely life, and produced something like seven thousand pages worth of this epic fairy war story. <laughs> Strange stuff, but that's a guy. It's it's definitely worth uh going down that rabbit hole too if you're uh, if you're interested. Kinder Kids is a is a great strip. This guy went on to be part of the Bauhaus. Uh he was a photographer in Germany after this. A lot of the early strip artists, you know, they were coming from different art fields. Yeah. You know, it wasn't like, oh, cartooning, like cartooning was new. Uh Melody, this has been I think reproduced recently. So this was about I think an exotic dancer and she had drawn it herself, maybe, and then whenever it was published by Kitchen Sink, it was redrawn, and then I think the original uh, edition has been republished recently. This, this was mentioned in, like, Palmer's Picks, and we were like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it's so some contemporary artists here, David Heatley and uh, Jeffrey Brown. I think both both Chicago guys. Yeah. Raw Magazine. Jacket to McSweeney's, number 13, what was the comics is issue. This was amazing, a who's who of, like, great cartoonist in this issue and i think they printed a ton of them 
and copacetic got a million of them man they had them forever but one of those like really great early 21st century comics uh you know try to get comics in front of new readers um this was a good one it's that gateway man very few like great anthologies out there man but you get a hold of that phone book you're going to come out with like five or six cartoonists you're going to want to find more work of it's a tremendous collection and i think it was printed in big enough numbers that you can find it for reasonable prices still robert crumb of course and then uh, ivan brunetti the last artist in this collection and my highlight from this yes is we get to see the entire process of a strip being developed. So it starts out with like lists of notes and, and sketches and stuff and evolves across several pages. It looks like even, uh, you know, probably different times and places. Cause these look like different sheets of paper. It's not like he's sitting in one spot yeah. evolving this, but it's the evolution of an idea and getting refined from then sketchy, rough layouts, uh, you know, tighter refining, working out actual figures and character designs, it's really great. You just don't see this very often. You can see the lettering guides ruled now as he's moving into a more final piece. Uh, finished like inks, color studies, and then final piece. It's incredible, right? <laughs> you just don't get to see this kind of process too often. So I, I think, and him talking through all of it. Uh, I think one of his big contributions is his syllabus, which has been published. And I think that was published through Comic Art Magazine, one of oh, the yeah, last issues. Yeah, it was. That's right. The but one with the uh, Tim Hensley cover. He, he, he's taught for a long time. I don't know if he still does very famously at, um, I think, the Chicago Art Institute and would publish his ser- syllabus online. And it was just really insightful and a lot of great ideas on comics. Combine that with like his comics journal interview and you get a lot of ideas on making comics and, and mechanics behind comics and stuff. Very thoughtful and articulate cartoonist. Nancy. Everybody loves Nancy, of course, you know, myself included, uh, did a tryout for to be Nancy. He did. Man. Cartoonist. So this is his tryout and then an original Nancy. Yeah. And then, and then when he got rejected, he like thanked them profusely. <laughs> like, what was I thinking? Crazy cat page that he kind of breaks down some details about crazy cat page. And I like crazy cat. One of the things I had never noticed before crazy cat is a very lively line. The borders and stuff are ruled borders. It's the only ruled straight edge in uh, Crazy Cat, but that kind page. of a no, no, in oh, all of it, like oh, the I ruled see, yeah. borders. But I never even noticed them. And then he kind of opines on the effects of having that kind of treatment, where like the borders fall away. You know, they're this almost foreign framing mechanism. Japanese influence. This is a. Uh, he made boxes of art where he cut up all of his like old childhood art and stuff that he had collected would cut them up into boxes and, and sold like a hundred of these boxes that contained his cut up artwork from his, uh, from his life. I don't I, I feel like that's a really, I don't know, man. I, I don't have any of my artwork from like pre 18. So like, I can't, I regret that. <laughs> so when other people destroy their art, I always, uh, it always hurts me a little bit. Japanese toy. It's neat the range of um, influences people draw from Japanese culture, you know, from art history to the comics to the toys. There's a whole lot of uh, different thing that people are drawing from. I don't know what this is about. Magazine clippings and photographs of Drew Barrymore from Brunetti's collection. That might have been too much information, Ivan. Just like, just, <laughs> just like that Charles Burns piece. Like maybe put that in a safe deposit box or something i don't know if you've read ha but man from an outlaw comics point of view if if content is your outlaw comics gauge this is one of the most offensive comics or, or books i've ever read i do remember it's incredible the, uh, the famous piece of uh, jesus fucking his stigmata i thought you were gonna say that the little boy chasing little girl with the coat hanger saying let's play abortion <laughs> no, i don't remember that, piece. that that but that book was highlighted it was it was like on a stand at the Pittsburgh Carnegie Library, like in the graphic <laughs> novel section. I can't, you know, nobody must have been reading graphic novels then. No so. parents. <laughs> Charles Adams, pretty cool to see him called out. Yeah. But this book's just full of that. You know, like like we really went through this quickly, believe it or not, because you could go down a rabbit hole on any of these things. Yeah. It's very well annotated, well indexed. Um, you know, further reading lists and things to look up from these artists. So this is a great, great book. Yeah, we had to put that under the microscope, man. And I, you know, I recommend it for anybody that's a fan of comic art and any of these cartoonists. It's an insight that's a little different than your average interview. 
we need to go compile our own uh, monograph, studio edition, whatever you want to call these things. Jimmy, uh, K favors, like, subscribe, follow the YouTube channel, hit the bell. We'll let you know when the next videos are available. We're on that race to 20,000 subscribers. Get us there. You can subscribe to the Cartoonist Kayfabe e newsletter at the link below this video. You can pick up Cartoonist Kayfabe t shirts and merch at the links below this video. Jimmy, I have an inkling to go wash my hands, man. <laughs> Give these guys their marching orders. Read more comics. <laughs>